Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the VPZD show. We're episode 15 now, VP. Aren't we, though? Aren't we? Are we? 15. We're... We, we're, we, we've been going strong for a few months now. We've strongly been going. And uh, <laughs> I'm Dr. Zubin Demania, one of your co-hosts, uh, UCSF Stanford trained hospitals physician and host of the Z-Dog MD show. And this is Dr. Vinay Prasad, who is a, right. what, UCSF uh, associate professor of medicine? And of epidemiology oh. and biostatistics, it turns Ooh. out. Yeah. <laughs> and that makes you completely unqualified to talk about Totally unqualified. Only yeah. a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics and a hemonc doctor here at uh, San Francisco General Hospital. So insufficient. And uh, we're the co-hosts of this news show, medical news show. That's yes. primarily what we do. We deliver the hard-hitting news. Very little editorializing, mostly news and facts. One hundred percent facts. Well, exactly. you know, to be fair, the news is no longer news anymore. It's That's all true. just two different versions of propaganda. So That's exactly choose. right. So. That's it. whereas we are a facts machine. We just we, we put machine. out nothing but facts. At least we're in the middle, you know. Yeah. Uh, these days, you know, I, I can tell you what the New York Times is going to say. I'm going to tell you what Fox News is going to say. You know, I know what they're going to say. At you know, least automatically. We, you might, you might not know what we're going to say. At least there's a surprise. Yeah, that's true. And the thing is, people will say, "Oh, you're not in the middle. You're always on the contrarian side." But uh, I don't think that's true, actually. If we were on the contrarian not. side, we'd be telling you not to get vaccinated. We'd be, we'd be big into uh, ivermectin and vitamin D. <laughs> oh! So, hey, hey, and we're not, actually, and we're not, we're not into good. that. This yeah. is good. Ivermectin, actually, I just, I, we should touch on that before uh, we talk, get large started. Large randomized control trial, New England Journal negative. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, it's starting to look like things are not going to bode well for the reputations of the physicians who've been pushing this as a cure-all and accusing other physicians of being incompetent for not pushing it as a cure-all when the data comes out and continues Let to come say, out. Let me say, so a total of 3,515 patients were randomly assigned to receive ivermectin, placebo, or another intervention. 100 patients in the ivermectin group had a primary outcome event compared with 111, so 15% versus 16%, and that's sort of not statistically significant. I guess... Um, I don't know. I've heard people make up the usual things. They didn't give it early enough, and you know they didn't. Uh, you know they didn't give it with a cupcake, and they didn't give it on a Wednesday, and you know all these things. The goal but posts. at the end of the day, yeah, the goal. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that the reason, the, the core issue people don't see is that biomedical interventions mostly don't work. If you think they do work, you have to prove under what circumstances they work. You can't ask me to show you that Santa Claus doesn't exist. You have to prove to me that Santa Claus does exist. Mm. Find him and show his face. I can't show you he doesn't exist. And I can't prove to you ivermectin will never work under any circumstances. That's impossible. You need to prove under what circumstances it does work. So yes, did this trial do it one way? Sure. But if you believe it works on day whatever, zero, you need to run your randomized control trial and show it works. And, you know, it needs to be large, not some small study. It needs to have good data collection, not dubious data collection. It needs to be run at multi-centers. You need to do that work. And the same is true for the, um, you know, masking toddler zealots. They need to do that work too. <laughs> they haven't done it either, you know? It's just, you know, one is the extreme left position. One is the extreme right position, but they're both the same kind of core problem. And they, they, and, and they would both say, but nobody's funding these studies because pharma. I mean, what, how do you yeah. respond to that? I mean, I guess I would say, to be honest, there's many more ivermectin studies than toddler masking That's studies. That's for so, sure. Yeah. You know, no, no one's funding the toddler masking studies, so we can't. But at least... Um, um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I guess I would say that um, the burden is on the people who wish to impose these things on others and wish to make recommendations to prove their recommendations work, that the burden is not on the, the, the skeptics or the critics. Um, and uh, with toddler masking, I have faulted them so much. They have failed. They are, they're a failure. All the people who proposed, who pushed for it, the AAP, CDC, they're failures for not running that cluster randomized trial. And I'm happy to call them a failure to their face. They failed the human race during the pandemic uh, by recommending something without generating evidence. And similarly, the people who recommend, you know, fistfuls of whatever supplements and minerals you think you're missing, you know, you're failing too. I mean, you can run those studies. To be honest, there's more funding for that than there is on the other end of it. That, that's for sure. I mean, honestly, it sounds to me like you're in uh, the pocket of Big Diaper. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure Pampers, who's paying you, Vinay? Pampers? Because it sounds like you just, you know, you're really against putting cloth diapers on kids' faces, you know, with no evidence. 
<laughs> By the way, my daughter, my 10 year old still has to wear a mask in her elementary school because they, oh, they, they, they brought it back because, you know, BA2, right. BA2. You know. I saw some some district brought it back because of gastroenteritis. Did you see this? Oh, <laughs> that's that's great. This is a new precedent. Any anytime someone gets the shards, like any anytime a kid shards in class, they have to wear a mask on their face. I, first of all, I don't know what it has to do with gastroenteritis, but I mean, I mean, do you bring it back if it, if there's a drought? If the drought goes on long enough, do you bring it back? I mean, yeah, what yeah, it, is it? A, is it panacea? The threshold, but, you know. Yeah. What I want to say is that what I'm pointing at is. You know, there's a principled thing to say here. Here's the principled thing. The principled thing is, if you think you can improve upon the state of nature, you need to prove it. The burden is on the person who believes in it to prove it to other people. And that's true for masking toddlers, and it's true for ivermectin. You know, the burden is not on the third party to disprove it to you. And I'm, and I'm a principled person, so that's why I'm going to hit him on, you know. And it just so happens to be one is the devout, devout view of the left and one is the devout view of the right or Covidian and, and uh, uh, what a Covidian tribes or, you know, those kinds of things. But um, that's just a coincidence. But they both are susceptible to the same sort of cognitive error, which is the pretest probability these things work is very, very low. So the burden is actually substantive and the burden is on you. Yeah, and I like what you said about if you think you can improve on nature, because yeah. that is the that's the gold standard. Can you beat what the natural process is? I mean, this this pandemic has unwound in a way that I think I would if when we look at it with the retrospectoscope, we're probably going to think, ah, oh, you know what, nature did its thing, and we had a very small impact until maybe vaccines came. We we had a very small impact on the natural history of this thing beyond like maybe drawing it out or or whatever. And I think it's on us to prove that we did have an impact. <laughs> it's the same thing. You know, it's like, if you think about the human body, it has been evolutionarily conserved for, you know, m hundreds of millions of years, billions of years, you know, depending on how far back you want to go. Um, in other words, all of your ancestors did one thing right, which was they were able to procreate and have the next generation. So there's a huge selection pressure over long periods of time. And that's true in health. That's why the body works so marvelously well. It's also true in illness. When we get sick, we generally do recover, yeah. you know, uh, from most of the things that get us sick. Of course, there are all sorts of ailments that are so bad that, you know, you wouldn't naturally recover. And medicine is about figuring out ways in which you can improve upon the body. But it's very difficult to improve upon the body. And if somebody comes to you and says, oh, you know, there's this enzyme in the body. And if we just tweak it a little bit with this drug, you know, it's gonna, you're going to be better off and heal better. I think your initial response should be skepticism because if that were really the case, it might have been selected for over, you know, so many hundreds of millions of years. Um, and so I think that's also borne out in empirical data that like most of the things we try do not work in, in you know, 50 years of drug development. Most of the promising things didn't work. Uh, few of those things did work. And how do you separate those two? You need data. You need data. That's the bottom line, uh, you know, and uh as far as being evolutionarily conserved, I mean, that's why I, as a male, have nipples because they're so fucking useful. Like, <laughs> there, there, there's no way I could have reproduced and had kids without male nipples. And you know what's funny? Actually, one, one last thing on this point before we move on to a Twitter thing that you saw. But I, I, today, I, after this thing, I've got to go uh, teach a class, lecture to a class at Stanford on digital health. I was asked to do this. Um, by some folks at Stanford. And so I'm excited because it's gonna be a group of, you know, 40 hardcore like enthusiasts in the medical school and business school. And I almost wanna tell them, so here's the thing with digital health, it's horseshit. Like until you show me a single piece of data that a wearable device or some kind of monitoring system or something actually improves outcomes above and beyond tincture of time and our standard of care that we currently have, which is probably garbage. Um, I don't even know why we're talking about it. I don't know why we're investing in it. I don't know why we're doing it. I would love to see the money go into actually studying, do these things actually work? Like just having a Google Nest camera in your house, listening for a particular type of wheeze and then alerting your doctor that you have an asthma exacerbation, does that actually improve outcomes? You know, stuff like that. It's fine to mentally masturbate over it, but without the data that it actually helps, you're, all you're doing is, is, is wasting money and time and diverting resources. You know, and I would say that my guess would be it's not going to work. And you, you might want to call me a skeptic, but what you should call me is a realist and a pragmatist and someone yeah. who's accurate because they don't work. You know, there's a recent study in New England Journal, I think this week, about whether or not sending people with COVID with a home pulse oximeter improved outcomes. And ah. the answer is, it didn't. Sorry. 
those pulse ox they told you to buy. And I remember in uh, 2020, they were like, if you get COVID, stay at home and keep checking your pulse ox. And, you know, if it starts to drop, go to the hospital. Well, it turns out that's no better than just seeing how you feel. And if you feel like you're, you know, it's you can handle it and stay at home. Uh, versus you feel like you need to go in. That's just as good as why. Your why am I not surprised at all? In fact, how many unnecessary ER visits happened because the thing glitched and said eighty eight, and the oh, person God. had a panic attack and showed up? You know, it, it it really is. We we do harm with these things too. That's the other problem. It's not just money and wasted resources. There's harm done. There's iatrogenesis done every single day in the hospital. It's the most dangerous place on earth, right? That that R- Redonda Vaught case. I keep telling people, oh, I'm like, yeah. if you want to live, stay out of the hospital. Like, like as much as you can. Anyway, so something happened on Twitter, though. Oh, I saw this funny thing, and I was about to say something, but then I realized this, I was, you know, I was going to go on. <laughs> I was going to go on vacation. I was like, I don't want to ruin my vacation. So. <laughs> you know, actually, a few days before vacation, you don't want to say anything. You don't want any. You don't. It's ruin true. I made that mistake before <laughs> I went. Before I went on a meditation retreat, I put something out that created all this controversy, and and, 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 I, and I was like, oh, I, I know I you were. Yeah, you may have been involved in that, <laughs> and I felt so bad when I came back and I looked, and I was like, no, what has happened? And it's like you missed two million messages. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and nine nine hundred thousand of them are furious, angry, and the rest are uh, well, ambivalent, it's, angry. It's it started out positive, and then it took a little turn. Yeah, that's a standard. Nothing better to do. Nothing better to do. They um, really don't. So here's what I saw. Um, I don't know if I should name the university, but it's a university's account, and they say, um, and I, I guess I shouldn't actually quote it. I should just give you a paraphrase, so no one can find it. But basically, some family donated a ton of money, and the amount of money is, let's say, between ten and twenty million dollars. Okay, to this cancer center, and it says, "Thank you for this family for donating all this money to this cancer center. We're able to do all this great work." And it has a photo, and in the photo, from right to left, there are doctors in white coats. There's the podium in the middle, and there are the members of the family who donated the money. In the background is um, the logo of the family name and the, the, the cancer center. That's in the background, and they're on stage, and they're in a hospital in an atrium, it looks like to me. And all of the doctors uh, on the stage are wearing the mask, and the family members are not wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> So it just shows you that for 10 to $20 million, you don't have to follow the hospital's masking policy. Uh, can, m- m- money talks and masks walk, man. That's that's <laughs> that's, a, that's an incredible uh, uh, story. And it's not unusual. Like, you know, like when the politician's the one not wearing the mask in the in the mm-hmm. elementary school, and, you know, that sort of thing. So I actually, that, that and that prompted my memory of this little Twitter thing that popped up uh, in, not I don't look at Twitter, but it was popped out. Someone pointed it out to me. Did you hear about this? medical student who went on uh, oh, yeah. yeah you heard about so, can we talk yeah. about it are you okay talking about it i'm okay i mean yeah i saw it's something like um the, the patient made a comment about the badge and this person said yes. so it took a few extra blood draws implying that's right that that's right subjected them to pain. that's right so this was this was so, a cl- yeah, you give a summary yeah. okay this, this is okay this is the story and this is my take so is, is a, a, a female medical student she's doing clinical stuff she wears a badge that says these are my pronouns and her name is pretty typically a female name so this patient who's probably a you know one of our typical patients asks the nurse and says why is that person wearing a badge that says what her pronouns are when it's pretty obvious what her gender is and um i guess she overheard this or something and so she 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 was supposed to do a dr- blood draw so she, on twitter she says so this happened and so it just so happened i had to stick him a second time you know to get the blood now we all know as a medical student, you're going to stick him a second time no matter what. I don't think she intentionally- you're not good at it. Because you're not yeah. good at it. I don't think she intentionally stuck him a second time. I think she was pointing out on Twitter, ooh, like, look, he got what he deserved for making fun of my pronoun badge. It just so happened that I had to stick him twice. Now, there's so much right and wrong with this. I mean, it, it, it it's beyond- it, again, it just points out to the stupidity of Twitter and even being on there at all if you're a medical student. Like, what the hell are you doing on there? Vir- so this person got suspended or something? Like, yeah. there's some punishment. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, so that's the thing. So the outrage on Twitter, and then it was basically said, the, the medical student schools basically said, okay, she no longer is... Uh, going near patients, which I don't understand as a medical student, that's a, a equivalent to saying you're, you're not a medical student anymore, right? right? So so I don't know what ended up happening, but I know that another, so she deleted her account. Uh, another medical student basically said, defended her and said, look, you know, she wasn't saying she stuck him intentionally. She's just saying, hey, that's karma. She had to delete her account for saying that because like, what do you mean karma? So 
This is one of those great examples of why we should just, if you're a medical student and you're out there virtue signaling on Twitter, spouting off, you probably should just spend more time studying or forgetting about it because it's gonna it's gonna lead to no good. The pronoun thing, I don't care about it. Like the truth is if she wants to wear a badge and it makes her um, trans and, and LGBTQ patients feel better, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, right? The patient also can make fun of her if he wants. That's fine too. It's just don't go to Twitter and make a big shit show out of it. You know, that's a very I mean, so th th that's one level of this really amazing point you're making, which I think is that and I do wonder um, some people on these websites, I'm like, what are you doing it for? I recently yeah. saw like, the, ch the chairperson at some, you know, university who like barely tweets and this person said something that got him in a heap of trouble. And I was like, you know, when you're a, you know. A, a, a more senior uh, faculty member, uh, not familiar <laughs> with the dynamics of these new websites, uh, and also you're very established in your career, and your career isn't really the public communication of science or anything like that. You know why? Why? Why are you going out of your way? You can only get yourself in trouble. You're not going to have yeah. some senior. You know, you're not yeah. going to have some some very con interesting point. You know, so I, you know, why is this old person on there? And similarly, I think early in your career, yeah, you know, you just don't have the job protection yet. You haven't really gone through all the training yet. And um, yes, you can contribute, but you also run a risk of getting yourself in trouble. And so, you know, right. I'm not saying do it or don't do it. I'm just saying you got to be extra careful. <laughs> Hey, um, a good rule of thumb might be if you're a young, you know, medical student, use your Twitter as an inbound. You know, use it to to learn as much as you can. You know, from your news feed yeah. and and watch the watch the madness. Uh, you know, it's because again, it's it's and because the the cancel culture is on both sides, right? It's like normally you think of cancel culture on the left. Now this this side was the right canceler. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think there's a dynamic shift where, um, you know, I guess. Um, she probably has some supporters as well who thinks, you yeah, know, you know, the way it was, you know, but there are also some obviously people who think, you know, that, um, you know, but, but here's the point here. So I, I think it's probably pitting two different cultures against, you know, it's pitting two different, it's a culture clash, but here's the thing I want to say. We need, there needs to be some, I don't know what it is. We need to learn in medicine that, or we need to teach perhaps better you are inevitably going to take care of people who you don't agree with on all sociopolitical issues. Yeah. Okay. You have to treat them with dignity and you have to, I don't know how to put it, uh, take it easy with all the issues you believe in. I mean, no two people agree on every sociopolitical issue. Even you and I don't agree on probably every single sociopolitical issue. We, right. we have a huge overlap. We're friends, you know, but we don't agree on everything. And, you know, somebody who was born in a different background, different socioeconomic status, different part of the country, um, coming from, you know, different region of the country, uh, different time, uh, you know, different background, grew up in different circumstances, is older than you, different generation. Uh, you're not going to agree on everything. I and and back, you know, when I was training, you, you didn't you, the less you knew about other people's full set of beliefs, the better, because you just focus on what you're taking care of them for, what their values and preferences are. You don't need to know everything. Um, but I will tell you one story. Many years ago, I was rounding, and uh, this was during the heated 2016 election, you know, Clinton versus Trump. And, um, you know, I'm in, I'm in Oregon, and in Oregon, Portland, of course, is probably extremely liberal, so it's like divided between Bernie and Hillary. But of course, you go one, you, you, go, you throw a stone outside of the city limits, and you're in Trump-Pence country. You know, that's the nature of the place. And, you know, we were rounding, and um, we, were, we passed somebody— um, who uh, had uh, uh, was in a wheelchair and had a big Trump Pence bumper sticker on the back of the wheelchair, you know, right on the wheelchair. <laughs> and um, you know, we were talking to this person. Um, uh, uh, this is one of our patients, but we run bumped into this person sort of just outside. And um, I was with the trainee, and then the trainee, uh, and then this person said something about I think the election. And then the trainee started arguing with this person about the election. I think, you know, the, obviously the trainee is a Clinton supporter and obviously this guy is a Trump Pence supporter. And I was Oh like, my what? gosh. Yeah. And I was like, I was like just as quiet as I'm as I usually have. And I'm like, oh my God. I was like, I was like, it's okay. And I was like trying to, you know, close the conversation. Like, oh well, we'll see you later. We're gonna come, <laughs> come over here. Let me take you by I was like, come over here. Let's 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 go. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I wanted to say, you know, what are you doing? We you don't need to get into it. Yes. You don't, of course, he's voting for someone that you're not voting for. That's okay. That's not why he's here. It's not our goal to persuade him. We're not campaigning for her, you know? Um, you wow. Know? It, you know, am I a Trump-Pence fan? No. 
okay? But, you know, is it my job in the world to talk about it every time? I say, no, leave it alone. Leave it alone. It's, it's almost like they took social media and brought it into the real world. Like, you know, it's like Briefly. it's like the guy was posting and she was disliking and arguing. And yet it's in the real world and she... <laughs> She's taking care of him. <laughs> Correct. And that's such a power imbalance. It really it really is a power imbalance. Yeah, and you got to imagine, like, forget it. What's funny now is it's crazy. It took me many years, but now I don't care what your politics are. Like, you could you could be you support whoever you want. It's not going to change my opinion. I'm not going to get triggered. I'm, none of that's going to happen, you know, because I just know everybody has different moral palettes. Well, you know, my friend, my friend Adam C. Fuga. <laughs> you know, you love this story? No. Um, all right. So, you know, Adam Sifu, I co-wrote a book with him, Ending Medical Reversal. He's a professor at University of Chicago. He's literally, you know, the nicest human being. I mean, he's like won, you know, 25 teaching awards in a row. You know, he's like always in the, he's like in the Teaching Emeritus Hall of Fame. Students love him. You know, he's got a very sweet voice. He's like, hey, how are you doing? You know, he's got a really good, you know, voice. You feel like you instantly open up to him. You know, he teaches you all this evidence-based medicine. He's a consummate clinician. You know, he's just he's just a great guy. In a classic, in the classic sense of the world, just a great human being, and um, he was asked, I think, by the medical residency program to put on a little fun debate for the residents, and the, and he would be debating another faculty, and the debate was really interesting. The, the proposition of the debate was: Do doctors have a duty to be political advocates? Ooh, not. Not are you allowed to be a political advocate. Of course, they had all conceded that you're allowed to advocate for whatever you want. But the question was, do you have a duty to be an advocate? Mm. And the other doctor debated the side like, yes, we have a duty because, you know, to the extent um, socioeconomics drives health uh, and to the extent that we are the people who are pushing for better health, we have a moral duty to advocate for political positions that improve socioeconomic status of people. And... Um, and Adam's point was he are had to, he, well he was tasked with arguing the other side by the way it's not like he's you know choosing he's literally asked as a debater to argue the other side like a criminal defendant lawyer mm. um, and his task is to say that we don't have a duty you can do it if you want it's great there are important causes but to say to go so far as to say you have a duty to do it that might interfere with at times the doctor patient relationship where sometimes you need to be neutral or not talk about these things right yeah. that's his stance. And then he did the debate and it went well because it was like in person. And, you know, like I said, he's a charming guy. Uh, then he posted on Twitter like some of his slides and he was like, oh, here's kind of my side of the debate. People might be interested. Oh, and he got a pile on like nothing. Oh, I my gosh. <laughs> uh. And they're like, you know, people were like, look at this white man doctor. Oh, there it is. That, you know, right. You know, it went to his race and gender and it was about who he was. And 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 and, you know, I and I, I, I hate to say it like um you know, although I'm sure that some of these things are motivated, you know, or that there is sort of a component of who's the speaker. In his case, I mean, he's just an earnest guy who's trying to do his debate. And um, I don't know. His thesis isn't even that strong. It's a, it's the soft thesis. Like, you don't have a duty to do it. Is that so wrong? I, I what think, I, man, about? I think what you saw was how Twitter reduces complex, nuanced, in-person a debates and arguments that are done in good faith to garbage, to trash. Garbage. Yeah, uh, and and that's it. That was actually the that's the takeaway from that whole thing. Forget even the premise of the point. It's like you know, here's a, a good faith debate that was well received at the time on all sides, and reduced to this this you know gender biased power differential garbage. Um, <coughs> yeah, I hate it. And I then hate here's it. the worst thing I can tell you that, um, and I I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but. Um, my impression is that he was really wounded by that. Yeah, of like, course he uh, was. Like you and I have thicker skin because we get barely though. I, I get pissed too. <laughs> I get really pissed. <laughs> I tried to. Yours I is thick. To. I try to. I'll tell you why that in a second. But um, uh, I try to like you know forget about it because. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, but um, you know he he's a guy who really is earnest and he it really does always you know i think try to do the right thing and in and and he's also somebody who likes to talk about ideas which god forbid there's a few people left who like to talk about ideas <laughs> and god forbid he's a guy who's actually willing to change his mind if somebody came and wrote back to the thread and you're like dr sifu i appreciate this but you know here's why i think we do have a duty like you know whatever i think he's open to change oh, his totally. mind oh totally yeah um, but you know, um, I, I don't think he's used to just having a lot of people pile on and, um, and, and be really, uh, I think very hard and unfair Yeah. because he's not arguing this because he's a white man. He's arguing this because he was asked to argue this and, 
and and it's not an uh on the face of it uh an indefensible proposition it's an it's an intriguing soft thesis it's a soft thesis and so it warrants some reflection and there's some kernels of truth to that which is like sometimes you do you know what, what am I, do i walk into a patient's room and say what do you think about vladimir putin and if they don't say the right answer i'm not allowed to treat him like is is this what we're doing in medicine like mm. how, what what you know how many issues do i have to be an advocate for or what do you think about recycling what do you think about tesla what do you think about elon should elon be spending all that fossil fuel and going to the mars <laughs> should he and you know if they don't and what what's the right answer what the, what do i know about it and then this is like a litmus test and then it's like and then you know no you know and then here's the treatment for you if you disagree you know like what what is this um mm. but now i think he has he's self-censoring like there there are lots of things he won't talk about and now we're all losers for that yeah you know, because now a smart guy is not self is self-censoring and other people are self-censoring now i don't think anyone on earth will ever touch that topic on twitter um, and once again i will point to the uh the central cause of all this twitter <laughs> It really is a poison. It's just a poisonous place. But it's it's also fun. It's also fun to watch. But uh, boy, I tell you, man, it is. It's, it's funny that it can be so much of our show talking about the f- crazy shit that goes on on Twitter because it's that kind of a place. And, and it does. The thing is, it'd be one thing if it was just an imaginary space, like an imaginary number. It's not. It's a real, it has real world effects. It, you know, the news reports on that shit. You know, it, it, it's really depressing. Which, That's which, what gets me. Ashish Jha, the only reason he's the COVID czar is, is Twitter. He, Twitter, yeah, tweets a lot. And then they always like, according to three independent experts I found, I was like, those are just the people tweeting. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> independent experts. You and I was like, and by the way, how how lazy have you gotten reporters that you just want to, let's open Twitter and see what somebody says. Oh, you know, like, man. And then the, sometimes the report is just a screenshot of the tweet. <laughs> yeah, like, I've seen that many times. It's like, damn, dude. And you can even click in. Click in so you can get sucked into that, you know, garbage, which is really, which is great because we had a vacation last week. It was spring break oh, for the yes. kids, man, which was- Good transition. Oh, you see how I do those things? We, I, <laughs> I was, so here's a funny thing. I've not been wanting to go and do public speaking anymore just because I'm starting to feel like I'm, I'm enjoying virtual better in that sense because I'm comfortable in my space and I can improv and it's not contrived and it's very authentic. But this week I went and I said, okay, these guys want me to come to Vegas to do a talk and um, and they're great, great group of people. And I said, my family, we have friends and fa- friends still and family still in Vegas. So we can all make it a trip. So we went for like four or five days. And this is what we found. We got on the flight. We're having to wear masks. Everybody's do- doing the usual Bay Area outdoor N95 lunacy. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. the minute we land in Vegas, it's like, it is insane. There's like, you know, 5% of people are wearing masks and they're usually in the appropriate risk groups. They're older people, et cetera. You can just tell or they're obese. They're doing the right thing for them. Uh, they're wearing a high grade mask and everybody else isn't. It's wall to wall people. We went and saw O oh, at Cirque du Soleil. It was packed theater. Nobody's wearing a mask. We went to the this exhibit, which is amazing by Meow Wolf called Omega Mart, which I highly recommend. I won't tell you anything about it. It's just worth going. You have to go. And you spend two hours wandering the, this, this warehouse of crazy shit and nobody's wearing masks. And it's like COVID barely existed. Like, and it was great. It was fan. Fantastic. And I'll tell you that the hospitals there aren't filling up. Nobody's yeah. dying in the streets. And so, again, the contrast between the Bay Area and there was remarkable. It was massively awesome. And then we came back and it was right back into it. But, you know, even the kids were like, so this is how people are living outside of where we live? And it's like, yes, yes, dear, this is how they're living. And they couldn't believe it. So, again, I think this so much of this is cultural and political and uh, science, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, the moment you get out of some of these uh, urban liberal strongholds, it's like Mardi Gras. It's like 2019. Yeah. You know? And uh, you you almost need like a field trip for some of these people to get out, get them out. Just, you know, both both sides can see the other side. You know, yeah, <laughs> you take exactly. Some people from, show them what San Francisco outdoor N95 looks like and vice versa. <laughs> 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 sort of an Im- immersion therapy. But yeah, it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing. And at the same time. You know, places like New York City have still have the the mayor is fighting in the courts for the two to four year old mask mandate because all the other rules are gone. Oh. They've dropped mask mandates on everyone. They've dropped vaccine passports. Even Kyrie can play. He can play yeah, now. He can play now. 
but these toddlers, they're not allowed. <laughs> they're not allowed to show their face. Ridiculous. And, you know, I listened to an interview and it, it, with um, um, Mayor Adams. By the way, I saw him on Bill Maher a few months ago. I thought he was a legitimate, like a legitimately smart politician. Right, right. And um, he seemed charismatic. He seemed like he was, you know, a Democrat, but also centrist, so he could kind of hold us together and, and win an election. Um, so I thought like, oh, you know, he's he's decent. Um, but now I see him acting like the stupidest person on earth. <laughs> I mean, are, you st- are, are you stupid? You think, does anyone think that a two, like, I mean, even the even the people who think we should mask don't think only the toddlers yeah, right. should mask. I mean, even they don't think only the toddlers. I mean, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You have to be your your advisors have to be the most incompetent people on planet Earth if your policy is only the toddlers mask, no one else masks. That's the stupidest policy I've ever heard. And he should have some common sense to know that that not only is that the dumbest thing he's ever heard politically. You think it's going to help you to be known as the guy who only masks the toddlers? Are you out of your mind? Why do you want that to be you? They're going to hang that over you for the rest of your your political career. You think you're going to who's going to vote for a guy who only masks toddlers in the pandemic it's he, a sign of yeah, go ahead. he's in the pocket of big diaper dude because <laughs> because these are cloth masks it's not like these are high grade you know you can't put an n95 on a on a toddler there's not even a, such a thing because it has to be validated and that's right no one can you have to get a certain amount of compliance I mean, I don't even know where to start. Obviously, yeah, it's the World madness. Health Organization thinks it's stupid to even try to do it, but to only do it, to only like, can you? It, it's like if you're straining pasta and uh, and you decided to plug up one of the holes. I mean, even yeah. if you believe it works, yeah. But it's more like not plugging any holes, you know. Um, what is he thinking? What and what? he's like, he lost the court battle, and then he's like litigating it, and they won some appeal, and it's like in the do, courts, do, and I'm dude, why there, are you fighting this? You, in you know courts? what? You know what? There must be a contingent of parents who are pressuring him. There's no other explanation. Like really but, fucking anxious parents who don't know science at all and are 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 pressuring him. I mean, I can't think of another reason a politician who's reasonably intelligent would do that. Yeah, but you. I mean, I agree with you that that's probably it. But as you and as you, you know, you you know that in both political parties. There is a fraction of people who are totally crazy. Yes, a fraction. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a fraction. Uh, maybe a, fraction. a large okay. fraction. Yeah. Maybe a large. <laughs> okay, maybe a large <laughs> fraction. But there's a fraction. Okay, and the job of a good politician is to hide your crazies. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yes. You, you you need them to vote, so maybe you don't want to ostracize them. Especially in primaries, okay. yeah. Yeah, in mm-hmm. prim- you need them to vote, but you don't want to be seen as if you're only catering to that view. Yeah. And I don't understand why. He, he could, there's so many other sort of thing, empty gestures he could do to kind of make those people feel better. Mm. Um, mm. Mm. It's, it is, it is, you know, it's like Will Smith level stupid. Like, oh. you know, go and <laughs> ruin, go and ruin. How did you, by the way, how did you feel when you saw that? I'm curious. This is, this is what people have been waiting for, my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is basically TMZ news right here. Well, uh, I would just say that my opinion is very close to Bill Maher. He had a whole monologue on it. And I mean, yeah. the gist of, the gist of his point of view is that like, um, uh, you know, you you, you 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 know you uh, you can't resort to violence. Obviously, yeah. You certainly can't resort to violence against a comedian doing their job, making a very mild joke about your wife. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, worst of all, though, I think Bill Maher's point that I thought was really excellent was that he stayed, he won, and he got a standing ovation, yeah. showing that the people in the audience are, are so unprincipled. Awful They're people. They're such shitty people. They're yeah, garbage. they, don't, e- they the don't even have standards. Celebrities yeah. are garbage fucking people, period, period. They, they are, true. why do we care what they think? Why do we care what they do? Because they look good. Fine, look at them then. Don't listen to them because they're garbage people to do that. Like, I, I was like, here's a comedian who you ought to be protecting his free speech right to say whatever the fuck. He could have made a nasty joke about her and should never have been hit. Come on. Come on. I mean, he's a comedian doing it. I mean, that's the whole job. You got to go there and razz all the big players that's in the your, audience. Imagine that's if it your, was Ricky Gervais. He would have been murdered. Murdered by Will Smith. <laughs> Will Smith would have stabbed him to death. Because, I mean, Ricky does not pull punches. And, and you know what, what's crazy? What, what, well, what, yeah, go ahead. Go on. No, but let's be honest. We're, we're, did you actually watch the Oscars live? I didn't watch it live. I watched no. all the replay stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't watch it live. Yeah. I mean, who the who watches thing, the Oscars? Well, that's another point Bill Maher makes that I think he's really right about, which is that when I was in 1999, when American Beauty won, I remember oh, like, yeah. the Oscars was the thing it to watch. It was the thing, yeah. And now I never heard of any of these films. Nope. I, I never, I never heard, heard of about a single any, one. I never, I never know any of them. I don't know. I never know what the film is. I don't know what it's about. I don't. I never even watch it later. I mean, that's what, right. I don't know what happened. I'm not interested. It's it's all you know mental masturbation for the celebrity set and like old people. That's it. Like my mom's like, didn't you see the Oscars live? I'm like, I'm not 80. Why would I watch? <laughs> why would I watch anything live? And, you know, and and what you know, Mar actually did say something a little bit interesting that I thought was vaguely worth talking about. Which he said, listen, if alopecia is your big struggle in life, like you know. That's pretty good. Like that's mm. that you you could have cancer, you could have leukemia, you could have all kinds of terrible chronic disease. Like, but the thing is that I think people who were defending Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith were saying, you know, for a celebrity and also a black woman, alopecia is more common. It is like a, a really big deal, and she's been public about it, so she didn't deserve to be made fun of. And here's a black man defending a black woman, which you never see. And so that was an interesting dynamic of that. That's all fine and dandy, and I see that perspective. But slapping a dude on stage because he made a joke about your wife, I, I, there's no excuse, really. You can't. You can't. I thought we. I thought they have a rule. You can't hit people. Is that assault I, yeah. and battery? Isn't people that just preschool? What they teach you in preschool? And but it did tell you too that I think the pandemic has made us insane. Uh, it's allowed this kind of like weird isolation. To, it, our emotions build up. We repress them, and then they emerge in these very dysfunctional ways. We see it on airplanes. We see it on the street in traffic. Americans are apparently crashing their cars at higher rates than pre-pandemic because they just they're it's full of road rage and distraction and madness. And we got to count that cost when we think about the cost of what we've done during the pandemic. Um, that has, again, has it influenced the course of nature that much? Mm. I, I opened uh, Twitter the day later and then it's like all the doctors I follow who are like <laughs> experts in like molecular biology are like, well, my thoughts on Will Smith, <laughs> one out of 12. I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, not every, and then, then it's like, you know, the same people talking about, they talk about COVID, Ukraine, Will Smith. I'm like, God, yeah. I'm sick. this is a it's, it's useless. Just, it's useless. <laughs> of course, here <laughs> we are talking about all those things, but yeah, well, but that's us. We're better than them, Fanai. No, but I guess uh, <laughs> naturally came to it. But um, yes. uh, Well, we're just uh, too people having a conversation yeah, so okay just, yeah, they're just, shouting yeah, into the void me. they're like look at me and care about my opinions whereas we're like hey Vinay, i'm actually curious what you think about will smith <laughs> i don't even know how we got on the topic but yeah you know, it was um, me i blame you yeah so the now you you had mentioned like this idea of masking and you said there was these doctors like these doctors who go to conferences, like the ones that I saw oh, at yes. this conference, nobody's wearing a mask, but the, the same doctors go home and they're like, you know, we got to throw masks on our kids. Like what, what's going on with that? Yeah, this is the one thing that I keep seeing. It's like, <laughs> like my, I see like this Mayor Adams is like, we got to get these toddlers in the mask. And then like the next tweet is like, hey, all the pulmonary critical care doctors are here at the conference. And they're like, all <laughs> stand in there maskless. and unmasked, maskless. <laughs> and they're like partying and like doing, you know, and, and then there's like, it's not even the regular conferences. Now they're back to the pharma conferences and all yep. these things. They're all back. Like, I was like, what, I mean, what are we supposed to tell? What is this? What is the message? Are we having a, there's such a crisis going on now with COVID. The hospitals are full. Things are so bad that, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And even though we don't have any randomized data and it doesn't make a lick of sense, we just got to mask these toddlers. Okay. Is that where we are? Or are we in the, Hey, it's Mardi Gras time for doctors. Okay. Which one is yeah. it? Which one is it? It can't be both. How can you have the frontline healthcare providers unmasked and partying in convention halls, flying everywhere, traveling, and then they got to make sure we mask these toddlers? This is like the stupidest thing. I mean, it's such I, a juxtaposition. I will, I, will, I will tell you what they will say. They will say, because we're quadruple vaccinated and the toddlers yeah. can't be, and we're protecting well, our most vulnerable. Yeah, but that's wrong in every way. So, I mean, you could argue that because we're vaccinated, we're at lower risk of bad outcomes. But the truth is, a four-year-old who's unvaccinated is at lower risk of bad outcomes than even a triple vaccinated 60-year-old doctor. Yep. So they're at lower risk of bad outcomes. That's one. Uh, two, I think you could say, well, we're, un we're vaccinated, so we're less likely to spread it. Oh, well, sorry about that. Once you get more than a few months out of your booster, your vaccine is not doing much to slow the spread. 
The third thing you might say is that, well, our conference is more important than their daycare. And the answer to that is, I'm sorry to tell you, <laughs> your superfluous, industry-sponsored, <laughs> shindig conference uh, is less important than a child's early life education. Uh. So, it, and whatever you want to say, this is it, it, there is no way to justify it. Um, you are, uh, uh, I mean, you can you could be consistent in one way. You could say, I'm going to the conference, and by the way, don't put the mask on those toddlers. Um, but you can't say, put the mask on the toddlers and I'm going to the conference. Then you're a hypocrite. <laughs> and you're the worst kind of hypocrite because you're, you're a disgusting hypocrite that prioritizes adult interests over kids' interests. The, the, okay, and you said something. These conferences are industry-sponsored shit shows of garbage. They're shit shows. They're shit shows. Even, even the ones I speak at, I'm like, I look at the list of sponsors who are paying my salary by proxy uh, <laughs> as the speaker, and I'm like, I feel so fucking dirty even just looking at this list of people that you know I, I would never directly take money from. And it feels terrible. That's why I'm, I'm, it's another reason I'm not doing it. I'm going to, you know, after the, I've committed to a couple more and I'm, I'm, I'm out, dude. It fucking sucks. Let me tell you the oncology ones. My God, here's, I mean, they like their whole purpose is like all the drug companies come, they buy out the center hall. Yep. The carpet is like eight inches thick. You, you twist your ankle in this carpet, my friend, you twist your break, <laughs> you, you break your ankle in that carpet. So plush. And then they're giving out cappuccinos and these doctors who are making like six figures, you, you should watch the glee that they line up for free cappuccinos. For free shit. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, what? You make so much money, dude. I was like, I was like, you're, you're minting money. You need a free cappuccino so bad. You want to wait 45 minutes? And he's like, but they put a digital photo of your face on the top in foam. I'm like, dude, just not. A, I was like, get out of here. Come on. He's like, but he's got my picture of myself in foam. I'm like, oh, my God. This is the kind of shit they're doing. And then. They go to the meetings and they're like, oh, we got a new drug. Oh, how does it work? Uh, uh, you know, it works. It kind of works like in the cell. Anyway, listen, the drug is great. It's just going to shrink tumors up. And then you're like, oh, how did you choose patients for your study? You know what? We don't have time for questions. Uh, you know, we got patients in this study. The tumor shrunk. It's a miracle game changer revolution cure. Okay, that's it. Yeah, you were done. Um, these conferences are such shit. They don't give you any methods. You can't even do a video like, oh, here are the downsides of the study. Because you don't know anything to know any the downsides of the study. And I, sw I swear to God, I think the only purpose of these conferences is to seed the propaganda. Like, if if the first time I mentioned to you, like, hey Z, I'm selling, I'm selling, uh, I'm selling this new pill. It's called, uh, it's called WX12. And you'll be like, oh, what is WX12? I, I don't know. Should I take WX12? What, what are the side effects? And you know, how much does it cost? And what, what do you not know about it? Right? Those are your questions. But imagine. You go to four years of conferences in a row, and in year one, I'm like, WX12 shrinks tumors in mice. No questions. Uh, year two, WX12 worked really well in this trial. No questions. You know, so you keep hearing WX12. By the time it comes around year four and five, you're really kind of acclimated to it. Yeah. You're comfortable with it. I've shown you some uh, 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 cappuccino with your face in it. You're, you kind of you think it's sexy. WX12 is sexy now. Yeah, maybe you're gonna you maybe you want to prescribe it. Maybe you got fewer questions for me. Um, and I think that's why they do it. The whole existence of the conference is to seed and to to get people to uptake these products. It's a psychological manipulation like yeah. anchor pricing, you know? It's like, yeah. you know, we were looking at the sushi place in Vegas and they charge $350 per head for omakase sushi, the fancy experience where the chef like is right there from Japan and he hands you like a live squirming shrimp and he's like, hi! And, and, and my wife and I were like, well, this sounds like an experience that we really can't afford, um, but let's call and see if they even have reservations just to see what, what's involved. So we call and they go, oh, so do you want the $350 omakase or the $500 omakase? And we're like, wait, there's a $500 one? They're like, oh yeah, it's like super crazy. Like there's all kinds of stuff. And then you go, well, God, that 350 omakase is not sounding so expensive anymore. You know, maybe we'll sign up for that. Uh, and so it's, it's this idea of anchor pricing. And it's the same thing that you're seeing at these conferences. It's this desensitization. I think that's also why, like, if you walk into a Costco, they have all the diamond rings up front, yep. and laptops, and be like, get ready to spend, buddy. And they're like, oh, everything else is so cheap. Gosh, it's practically free. I can get a 20-pack of brownies for like five bucks compared to a $2,000. For, for, forget about the fact, can you eat that many brownies yeah. before it goes stale? <laughs> or before your kids get tired of it. Like, the kids are like, oh, I had the sample, and that, that shit was so good. Daddy, buy me the 27,000 pack of it. <laughs> and like five into it, they're like, yeah, this is, I don't like this anymore. It's like, God damn it. Um, the novelty's worn off. Yeah, Costco nails that whole thing. But you know that the Costco's r r stakes aren't high like I don't know cancer treatment. 
Uh, so maybe we ought yeah. to really look at that. But yeah, yeah. Now, These conferences are all trash. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I, 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 I've never. I can't tell you the time I went to a conference and I learned anything of value. I mean, and then the other thing is like, oh, my friend, he's an expert in a certain one tumor type. He says that I'm like, oh, don't you need to go to the conference to keep up? And he says, um, if if I go to that conference and anybody says anything I don't already know, I'm not good at my job. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know? I was like, oh, shit. And yeah. then, you know, people are like, oh, it's great for networking. I'm like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's fun. It's fun for networking. Is it great for networking? I don't know. You know, I've always been a skeptic that like people's career trajectories are much different by, you know, glad handing and networking. Uh, but, you know, because I don't think you, no, no amount of glad handing can overcompensate for like not having talent uh, or having talent or vice versa. Um, uh, but, you know, you meet people and you go to drinks and have fun. All that said, though, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, whatever early childhood development is uh, massively orders of magnitude more important than these conferences. Man. Um, <laughs> well, that's the one they I, I've been wanting to take a shit on these fucking conferences since I was born, basically. Can I tell you a secret? I, during, in my entire practicing medical career as a hospitalist, I never attended a single conference. They looked like a waste of time. They were full of boring fucking people. The speakers were God awful, terrible. The whole thing was poisoned by pharma and by medical devices and by insurance sponsors and everybody. The whole thing looked like one raging conflict of interest. Then I go and I I, I build a clinic and I learn about Health 3.0 and I think I want to evangelize this to the world. Where do I get to do it? Who's the only people who are willing to pay me to do that? <laughs> Conferences. Conference. Yeah. So <laughs> I then spent the rest of the time building my own platform so I would never have to rely on anyone to speak truth again. And now I'm finally at that point and it's it dude Vinay, it's still so hard to say no when someone says oh we'll pay you this much money to come and you know talk to our audience about this and then you go there and you regret it instantly when you just even look at the fucking list of sponsors and you're like i feel dirty just even standing here and it's not like the people in those companies are bad people it's just the whole structure of it is garbage and i even I, saying I this right now because i yeah i don't get those invitations ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we should do a trading places thing where yeah. like you're me for like a couple months and you go and do these things. Like, cause I mean, you know, they're, they're, all these people are such racist. They'll just think you know us what? two brown if, people if, look the same. Of course we, we could, <laughs> it was like, if I could use your ID in college, I'm sure I could buy. But you know, uh, uh, if we trade places within one day, you'll, you will be like me on email, not being able to respond to all these emails. Uh, it's true. It's true. It's exactly what true. What did I want to say about this conference thing? You were talking about how lousy they are and shitty they are. Uh, it's so true. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, I had an idea for it. Okay. I've gone to so many of these conferences and um, and sometimes you go to like an oral session. It's like Friday afternoon. You know, this conference is always like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The ones I go to, like four days. Right. Like bonanzas. And then Sunday is like the, the key day. Um, then they also have a Monday or Tuesday, but that's like for like the dregs, like people who didn't, you know, that's like you you really feel bad if you're assigned to the Tuesday slot. Right. Gone. Workshops. Okay, so yeah. Workshops. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so like two, Sunday is the big day, the plenary, like the big posters, the big stuff. I've walked in on Saturday afternoon. I go into some talk and it's like, oh, you know, it's like the best of lymphoma or whatever. And I go into this talk and you never know what you're going to get. Like you could get a great dynamic speaker, really interesting information, or you could get like uh, talks so bad that you just, you just want to die. Stab you're your in eyes. That chair. Oh my God. Like you get bored even looking at your phone. Like, that's how bad it is. You're like, why is this person jar, j you know, jibber jabbering in the background? When I got to look at my phone. I can't even look at my phone in peace. Um, <laughs> it's, it can be really painful. And then I thought to myself, like, well, why is this the case? And this is because, like, they are, they're picking the abstracts based on a 200 written word submission and not somebody slides and delivery and all those things that make a good talk. Mm. And then I was like, here's my idea. It's like the NCAA tournament. It's a conference. Thursday, everyone comes, and everyone is assigned an oral speaking slot for 10 minutes. You get to present your work for 10 minutes. And uh, you present it in hundreds of small rooms. And everyone in the room can vote on who's the who are the best talks. And only one advances to the next round. Oh. Fridays. Okay? Then Friday, round two. You present again. And then Saturday, you present again. And then Sunday, it's just the people who who like win oh, the four man. rounds, like March Madness. And the plenary is like the 10 best talks or whatever. Oh. And I think it would be great because you're guaranteed you go in on Sunday. Every talk has cleared three hurdles, and it's probably going to be really good. And, you know, more people get to see what's really good. Dude, it's Oncology's Got Talent. 
That's what it is. <laughs> like you have yeah. to keep progressing and you you got these, oh, that's, that's actually, a, boy. The only downside is you could imagine some bias being inserted, like the most entertaining presentation that may not be factually, you know, very correct. Uh, yeah. So it depends Somebody on who said the that, like, It penalizes people who have great science, but bad delivery. And right. I'm like, you know, I mean, I'm sympathetic to that. Right. But if you have great science and bad delivery, then you should publish papers. But if you're giving an oral talk, it is about the whole package. And, you know, and then the other thing is, I mean, hopefully the audience is not so foolish that they can be bamboozled by right, uh, right, uh, right. a silver tongue. Right. You know? I mean, these are pre technically audiences of their peers, you know. It's not like, you know, presumably, pres <laughs> presumably. So what's up with this woman who got fired in New York City, man? Like, <clears throat> oh, so this is a it's related to that. This is a woman who is, it works in like the law department in New York City. And um, she confronted Eric Adams and said, like, hey, you said you were going to drop the masks and toddlers, but you got it on. Uh, and then like that. The, that day, like later that day or the next day, she got fired. Ooh. She's also a lawyer who's supposed to defend in court the New York City's whatever um, stupid policy. And she tweeted that, you know, I've done a lot. I've defended a lot of criminals in, the, in my life, but I really feel bad trying to defend this stupid policy. Um, Ooh. And somebody was like, oh, well, see, you're not allowed to do that if you're a lawyer. I'm like, I, I think you are allowed to do that. <laughs> you're allowed to say she didn't say I'm not going to defend it. She didn't say I'm not going to do my job. She just said. This is the stupidest thing I've ever had to defend, <laughs> which is <her> problem. <laughs> which is saying something. Yeah, which is saying something. That's saying something, especially in New York. And it is, and it is true. It is pretty yeah. stupid. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. this whole this whole everyone, you know, it's the usual. Yeah, take take away their job. <laughs> you know, like somebody does. Like I don't know. In a job, you do like a hundred thousand things. But then, like one tweet, take away the whole job. You know, like it's, nobody looks it's, at the totality of the evidence. Again, I, I I will say Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> Twitter. We, In this case, you know, yeah, she she did push him face to face. Oh uh, yeah, that's true. So it is a little it's a little different. Uh, now speaking speaking of face to face, you were saying that we were talking offline. Apparently, a lot of people out of medical training now are going directly to work for pharma. Or what are you seeing? Uh, I think well. I think a lot of us are seeing, uh, well, that, that, that is true, that a lot of people finish trading and go to, go to pharma, especially in my field of oncology, but also a lot of academics who are like two years in, five years in, seven years in, 10 mm. years in. Not a week goes ever, you know, uh, uh, you, you're away for the office for five days, I come in, you know, and then somebody's like, oh, you hear? So-and-so's leaving to go to this company. So-and-so's going to AbbVie. So-and-so's going to Genentech. So-and-so's going to AstraZeneca. I'm like, dang, who's left? Who's left? Yeah. I was like, we're getting, but you know, they always find a way to get the the fellows right out of fellowship and and pay them a, a, an inferior wage because they don't know any better. And mm -hmm. you know, that's how they keep. I mean, it's, I really feel bad sometimes. It feels like academic medical centers are a handful of people who've been there thirty years, and then a whole slew of like first, second year graduates until they burn them out and then send them off and then you know burn through the next generation. Um, it feels that way. But I was thinking, why are so many people going to pharma? Um, and why does it feel as if it's different than in prior years? And when you ask people going to pharma, they often say like, well, you know, I just felt like I could do the work I'm interested in clinical trials, but at a bigger scale. And I actually think that they're onto something, but I would rephrase it. I think what has happened is over the last 15, 20 years, we have made um, the job of being an academic oncologist at a university and the job of being a pharmaceutical oncologist at Genentech, the same. Like they have the same mission. Uh -huh. All they do is work on trials. All they do is deal with a company. All they do is advance scientific products. And so we have made the academic mission, the industry's mission. And so then naturally, you're going to look and say, my mission is no different than the mission over there. They pay you 100 grand more per year or more. You have more flexibility, fewer hours to work, better benefits. Um, more of your money comes as stock rather than payments. Why not do what I'm doing over there and do better for myself? Yeah, and less stress. And I actually think what we should—the failure is that we've made ourselves just like the arm of pharma. Right, right, right. So academics needs to actually change back to its, you know, original configuration or mission. Right. If you want to keep uh, people in academics, and you should value teaching and actually really compensate people for good teaching. Right. And reward good teaching. And, and then the bench and, and clinical research that you do there is not just about developing products. It's about expanding all the things that 
bench and clinical research is supposed to do. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, at Stanford, this was a, a epidemic. I mean, every single hemonc person oh, I knew went into, ultimately ended up at Genentech or somewhere. And, and uh, a lot of the pharmacists actually left and ended up working in the pharma companies. And look, there's not look, there's nothing wrong with nothing wrong. working in industry. That's fine. We need that too. But the thing is, if it just becomes a thing, it's just like here, everybody, you know, UCSF, Stanford, everybody, all the med students want to go work in at startups or work for digital health companies or, you know, all this other yeah. eat vaporware that, <laughs> that, that, you know, and look, I, I'll be honest, when when I finished my residency at Stanford in, in medicine, you know, I wanted to go into GI when I right. went into the program because I was like, oh, this is great, man. So you get to play video games in people's asses. It's like, you know, it's it, it, it was interesting intellectually, GI physiology for me. But then I did the rotation and I'm like, I hate this so much. I don't like my mentor. I don't like anything about it. And I had a panic attack. I'm like, well, shit, now what am I gonna do, right? So I finished medicine and I took a year and worked in in these two little med ed startups and uh, thinking, oh, you know, the grass is greener. I'm in the Silicon Valley, it's 2002. Like, And what I learned from that was, wow, like this is an empty, vaporous, garbage space and all that that energy and vulnerability that your patients would show you and that connection all of that 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 was all gone and so it drew me right back into clinical medicine but i needed to do that i needed to go through that but i think a lot of people never get the clinical uh they, they never get hooked by that or never get the opportunity to be hooked by that which is really a shame you know it's really well put and i think that your your point i want to reiterate is like yeah it's not it's not about like there's nothing wrong with going to work for pharma it's a fine job and you know we need people to do it and a lot of great people do it a lot of very smart people do it yeah and uh, there's nothing fine with wanting to make a startup a lot of smart people do that too uh i think i will flip it on and point to the academy academics if they want to keep anybody they need to figure their shit out they're going to get lose everybody because um uh, you're not going to be able to compete with these other people in terms of money. You're not going to be able to pay these people as much. You're not going to be able to give them a more flexible lifestyle because patient care is inherently not very flexible. Uh, you know, you can you can run, but you can't hide. They're going to pay you. They're going to find you. They're going to get your opinion, you know? Mm. Um, in my mind, I think the failure is that many, many talks and conferences I go to are all the same cheerleading for drug products, cheerleading for drug products. Universities are making partnerships with drug companies, you know, drug companies that are building, you know, they're, they're working together to build a building on campus, you know, to go into partnerships for different therapies and this. Everybody who works at a university is thinking, how can I get the drug to market? Where are the people thinking about, hey, is the drug cost effective? Hey, does the drug work in elderly people? Hey, does the drug work in people with lower socioeconomic status? Hey, what happens in the real world when people dose reduce? Does it work? Hey, that clinical trial you ran, was the control arm fair? There's no, there's nobody who's funding that or cares about that at the university. And if you don't do that, then you're making the university basically the same job description as pharma. And as long as it's that, people will keep going. You need it to be something different if you want people to stay. Um, and I think they are failing miserably. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a massive hole in the whole thing. You know what's funny is last night I had a nightmare, a clinish a clinical nightmare, which I haven't had in a while. I have them every now and again. It's kind of like a residual echo of PTSD of my years in the hospital uh taking call Q4 days with the residents and all of that. And it was, I, I was suddenly, you know, it's like inception. How do you know you're in a dream? Well, you can't remember how you even got there. So suddenly right. I was on call and uh, was called to the ER and there was a patient who's had elevated blood pressure. And for some reason I had sent him home, not knowing what was up. And then I looked after the fact at his blood pressure and it was 327 mm. over something. And I'm like, that's a fatal Rout blood route. pressure. I sent him home. So I spent the rest of the dream trying to find this patient, like talking to the clerk and the clerk was spelling this patient's name and I was trying to write it out and I couldn't get it right. I kept misspelling it and I couldn't get it right. I couldn't contact this patient. I started to panic. And then I realized, I realized, oh my God, I think my malpractice insurance lapsed. This guy's going to go home and die, I'm gonna be responsible for it. And then I'm gonna be ruined financially. Like all these things are happening in this dream and I'm just starting to panic and I wake up fucking almost screaming. And I realized, wow, 
that was 10 years of my life. <laughs> that's actually, that's actually many, many times, like not that, right? Cause that's absurd, but that's what clinical medicine can be like. It's very stressful. You're, you're, you're always second guessing. You're always worried about stuff. It is inflexible and it's exhausting. And so you have to really kind of, we've talked about this before, but if it's enough to give me anxiety dreams, you know, years later, uh, it tells you that we ought to really be focusing on supporting people who do that kind of work too and making the work more sustainable. You know, you're really onto something because um, there's going to be, the crisis is just going to get worse more and more. There are more and more opportunities to be a doctorpreneur. <laughs> <laughs> I love that word. Uh, yes. Dr. Preneur, there are more and more opportunities to do other things. I think you're onto something, which is that, like, what makes medicine great? Talking to people, thinking about the problems, thinking about what are the best things that go forward for that person. That's what makes medicine great. What makes medicine terrible? Paperwork, trying to actually get things to happen because they involve many, many clicks and opening browsers and two-factor authentication and all this stupid computer bullshit, uh, you know, uh, how, and, and, and the way to solve this problem is to allow, you know, doctors and NPs and PAs and pretty much everybody in medicine to do more of the job they want and get more support for all that nonsense that they don't want or to eliminate the nonsense that they don't want, you know? Um, and like, I have a colleague who works in a clinic that's really efficient. The colleague's like, um, the reason I'm able to like work so efficiently is that like I walk out of the room and I just tell this person who sits there, like, you know, what are we going to do for this person? What's going on and what they need to order and set up. And then I walk away and, like, they don't have to type anything. They don't have to put all these orders in. And I was like, that's that. Is, and somebody else is there to like, you know, oh, the scan came back now. You want to take a look at it? Like remind, like be a helper to this person. And I was like, that's what you need to be doing to make people want to stay, um, to make it less stressful is to have like proper support. Uh, but they don't want to invest in that because that just cuts away their uh, their nonprofits. It's going to happen. Their nonprofits. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's going to happen that uh, people are just not going to want to do it and it's going to come to a crisis. It's already there. I mean, yeah. well, and yeah. COVID has made it worse. I mean, there's a, there's a term in business called capability. And it's just a wonky way of saying, do people feel capable in their jobs to do what they need to do and be morally at ease and capabilities made up of having the tools, meaning the right technology, having the resources, meaning the team and the, and the staffing and the support and having the autonomy, meaning the trust and the, the support to make your own decisions. If you have those three things and they've looked at doctors, right? If those, if they, if they score high in capability, the organization is more profitable, there's less turnover and there's better outcomes. It's like, well, uh, why don't we focus on capability? Because it, it's a doable thing. Like it's a, it's a metric you can actually shoot towards. But like you said, it's just like in, in the academy that everybody's building these buildings and doing all that. That's what they're doing. They're building extra wings with their money. They're not actually investing in the only thing that matters really to, to their long-term success, which is their people and uh, the clinical enterprise. Um, and, and if you donate 10 to $20 million, you don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> <in your> <laughs> <laughs> Masks are only for us poor doctors. They're, By the way, I would be pissed if I was a doctor working there and I saw this donor get to walk around. I'm not allowed totally, to walk around without a mask. Totally. I'm so pissed. Totally. It's a, and, look it's, at, and look at this shameless cancer center for $20 million. You can do whatever you want. How many more million? And you could probably, they probably let him come in with active COVID infection. Oh, cough totally. Everywhere. His PPD positive spewing, you know, yeah, mycobacteria. PPD positive for a hundred for a hundred million. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can, you yeah. can you can cough TB all over our staff. You can come in with febrile. You can come yeah, in febrile. Why not? Million. Why not? I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, the, These universities keep prostituting themselves out to donator donors and things like that. It's that's ridiculous. It's another structural problem. Yeah, is the need for cash in all these institutions, and then the internal Some of these, politics. Like, public public institutions. By the way, I, I really do want to know, what does like tax money go for? I mean, where are they, what are they doing with it? Because uh, all these public universities apparently are like always trying to beg the the nearest billionaire for a few bucks. Right. I mean, don't they have any tax money? <laughs> right. It's kind of like, wait, wait, what? No, we're actually spending all our tax money on the 101 freeway, creating an express lane that charges your fast track so you can use the HOV lane. Did you see that? Oh, is, that is that what all that construction yeah. is? I have not, yeah. yeah. And it says, know. they have the gall to put up a sign that says, your tax dollars at work. So wait, so you're spending my tax dollars to charge me money to ride in this lane? Come on, dude. This is ridiculous. And we we have a, what, a nine, a 12% marginal tax rate in California on state? 13.5. Sorry, you're right. 13. I'm in denial. 
You're in denial. I'm in denial, you know? It, it, it's, and what's that tax rate in Vegas? Uh, that'd be um, zero. Wow. Yeah, I, moving back mm. here was the biggest eye poke I've ever the suffered. Dumbest decision, dumbest decision in the history. And I, it's I, the toddler masking of your life. It's the dumbest <laughs> decision you've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> except, except I'll say this, it was the smartest decision because it was for my wife to take her job yeah, back. No, and you, if your wife is happy, then you're happy. So uh, we did it, we took we took the hit for that. And it's actually been net positive, but God, I miss Vegas. I miss that zero tax. I miss the non-masking. I miss the food and the travel and the general sense of purpleness of the state. Um, it's a very alt middle place, uh, which and I the like. Sunshine. And the oh, sunshine. I can't tell you how much that matters. Right, you know, you're for, you went, you were in Portland for so many years. Like the minute I, I, we used to open textbooks to read about the sun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man, you were getting vitamin D by proxy, like just through the book, just reading about it. Yeah, it, it really does change your attitude. I was much happier in general. I get a little grim around here sometimes. Although, you know, you're, the difference between where you oh li- screw you, yeah, yeah I know, I'm I know, the right? The difference where you limits. live and where I live, like it's like literally a thirty minute drive max, but like it's sunny almost all the time over here and where you are, it's just like- You know, I tell people that Portland is like three months of California, and then it's like nine months of sleeping in the produce section with that mister going. (laughs) It's just (laughs) nine months, that mister. And it's not a heavy rain, like you don't always have to wear a hood, but you are getting misted. And it's just, you're just wet and mossy. Oh. And- you know, but I'm a happy person. I used to bike a lot and that, you know, that keeps your mood even higher. But when I came here, I felt like cobwebs were lifted out of my mind. Yeah. The sun is really nice. Yeah. When I, when I moved from UCSF down to Stanford, it was like a massive shift in my mood. Like I was happier in residency than I was in medical school, which is crazy. I really was. Yeah. Uh, whereas my, my wife who trained at Stanford as a medical student and then stayed at Stanford as a resident had the opposite. Like she was miserable as a resident. So I do think there was an element of, oh, of weather change. Sunshine. Yeah. I think there really was. I mean, objectively residency is more work than medical school. Oh, by far. But it was just that whole climate at UCSF was just in the inner sunset where I lived. It was foggy and grim and you just never saw the sun. Um, and you couldn't park, you know, which sucked. I remember that. Did, did they still charge you for the parking at that gym? Yes, they still do. But I've managed to like figure out ways to weasel, like I'll park here, then I'll move it here. And I, all to save like four bucks in parking. Uh, but I won't give Stanford my money. Sorry. They can't have it. You know, there's something that really irks me about coming to work and having to pay a hefty parking fee it's, because it's like, you know, I'm not here because I want to be here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Not here because I want well, to Once here. again, capability. Like, do you feel capable when you have to pay for parking? It seems like you don't have the tools, resources, and autonomy to do your job if they're asking you Also, to pay. they have like these, um, sometimes you go to parking garages and there's no spaces left. Why oh, the hell that, are they letting yeah, people what? in the bottom? Come on. Idiots. Close the shit. You know, Vegas knows how to do that. They light it up green and red in those in those hotel parkings. So what's available? Um, and they tell you how many spaces are there. Vegas does a lot of stuff right. And a lot of stuff crazy wrong, but yeah, mostly right. Um, dude, so what's up with this fourth dose and Peter Marks and all this stuff, by the way? Oh uh, yeah, fourth dose, fourth dose. Yeah, I know. No. <laughs> Didn't I always tell you it was a four dose vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> four dose vaccine. Um, well, I think the fourth dose is controversial. European CDC said recently that they'll only recommend it if you're over 80 or if you're a dwelling in like a nursing home Mm. this country pfizer said hey please give us the authorization for 65 and up and peter marks at fda said hey we'll give you 50 we'll just give you 50 (laughs) and up and they didn't have an ad com they didn't have the advisory committee before and um peter marks of course is the guy who's taken over for the two people that have been pushed out um i think he's got a big rubber stamp on his desk because whatever pfizer does he's rubber stamping Mm. he's done a lot of like really i think bad decisions um, like moving the the booster up a month for Moderna, citing Pfizer data. He didn't have an ad com for fourth dose saying it was like an obvious decision, nothing obvious about it, like Europe is not doing it, and a lot of people are critical of that decision. Right. Um, I just think he's not doing a good job. Yeah, I mean, that sounds... Yeah, I think he's, he's just doing a shit how, how can you How can you look at what they're doing and not go, oh yeah, this guy's just, these guys are all just basically pharma cash registers at this point? Because, yeah. you know, again, if you show, 
fine, 80 and up, whatever. And you know what? Giving people the, like if they wanna get a fourth dose, that's fine. I've had pharmacists reach out to me and they're like, I can't fucking believe they wanna do a fourth dose. Now I gotta administer I mean, a fourth dose to a bunch of worried well people that have no, yeah, no reason for a it. A 51 year old who's running marathons yeah. is gonna rush to get the, and by the way, how many, I mean, if the, if we're talking about giving options, should they just give you the option of giving like the 90 doses like that German guy got? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The German guy who took 90 and then like sold the passes or was like forging them or something. I was like, dude. I mean, how, how many doses should you be allowed to get if you want? Like 100? Right, I right. mean, what? I mean, I don't know. Shouldn't there be some evidence that the dose helps you or is that like Yeah, or yeah. or or at least evidence that it doesn't harm you. And they're saying, "Oh, well, what's the harm? What's the harm?" Well, we don't you don't know cuz you haven't looked at it. I saw somebody uh somebody who is a self-proclaimed public health expert who's gotten everything wrong say, uh, <laughs> "There is no harm." I was like, "Oh, there is yeah, no." <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've heard that before. I was before. like, "Yeah, and then the, and this is the same person who said masking toddlers just makes it has a lot of good science to back it up." Uh -huh. <laughs> a the, lot, of, really. These a are lot? the people who are like, you know, prophylactic aspirin for a myocardial infarction sounds oh, like a yeah. great idea. And then you actually look at it and you're like, well, no, maybe not because aspirin isn't harmless. Yes. Oh, yeah, they were, you're right. They were the same ones who were like, uh, an aspirin a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah. It turned out it didn't. Yeah. It didn't keep it. Turns out it shows away. you end up in the ER with a, with a perforated gastric ulcer. Um, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many people I took care of as a hospitalist who were the victims of casual NSAID use or prescribed NSAID use in the form of a daily aspirin who would come with a GI bleed. And um, they don't count that cost, you know? I, yeah. yeah. Well, now we have some new randomized trials and the guidelines are changing slowly. And so yeah, that is yeah, good. Yeah. We have what, Esprit and, uh, yeah, we have these two new studies. Yeah. Like aspirin. Yeah. So things will start to shift to more evidence uh, appropriate practice. I like evidence appropriate. Do you like that? It's, it's evidence adjacent. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yo, yeah, Peter Marks, he's evidence adjacent. Um, he's evidence adjacent, the, the, he's not evidence the, the, the adjacent, the, the evidence is in the other room. He just hasn't looked at it, but he's, <laughs> he's, he's adjacent to it. I mean, my only question is when he leaves FDA, is he going to go work for Moderna or Pfizer? Right, which one? <laughs> which, which one? Which one? That's the only question I have. Which the one? only lingering question I have. I mean, he's done such a bad job. I don't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to tell, I hate to say that he's done a bad job, but he has done a bad job. Yeah. I gave him the first 10 screw ups, but like, I mean, the 20 screw up i don't know <laughs> i mean this whole uh, i'd be curious you should try to get your friend paul to come on and talk about this fourth dose i'm sure he's oh he's got strong it. opinions i'm sure i'm almost scared to have him on because i don't want to get him canceled i know yeah i know i saw him he was doing his best at the meeting yesterday you can watch on youtube oh he's yeah doing his best to like you know not not be too mean to them um, <laughs> i don't know man it's really it's depressing i think when i think about it because i feel like um you know, I had this guy on my show recently, and he said that something like most of the misinformation uh, that's been problematic during this pandemic didn't come from Joe Rogan. It came from the mouths of public health experts. Mm. And I think that that's this whole thing that no one will acknowledge, uh, or maybe they're only reluctantly acknowledging that, you know, most of the biggest screw ups were done by the experts from school closure to, I would say, lockdown to lying about mask data to pushing it to toddlers to just allowing Pfizer to just open our wallets and take whatever they want. Mm. I mean, should, should, you know, should you write your check on April 15th just to Albert Borla or should you write it to the <laughs> Treasury? Yeah, and, and, and yet, you know, people are losing their Medicaid now because this, this funding is running out, but we're giving tons of money to Borla. 36 billion? Borla. 36 billion? No, no, no. Actually, it's more. It says that this year, Pfizer will make a hundred billion. You know, we oh. we're, we already bought five billion of Paxlovid. By the way, Paxlovid, there is a trial in vaccinated people, but they're not releasing the results. Oh, I mean, come on. Wait a minute. Yeah, because they really only looked at it in unvaccinated people. Correct. Ah. and so all the yeah. Do we have any like what is the risk reduction in vaccinated people? We don't know. Wow. And, we're, and again, this is like, you know, this is like Tammy flu. This is Pfizer just collecting money. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. I. I don't know, man. I'm just hoping this thing burns itself out and we stop talking about it and can move on. But I, I, that's maybe wishful thinking. The only thing I was grateful for in terms of Ukraine was that it, it distracted us from COVID and people stopped talking about it. Yeah, barely. These people, yeah. they, their, um, their Ukrainian flag in their Twitter bio is uh, <laughs> collecting dust because <laughs> um, they're no longer uh, talk about it as much. Yeah. yeah. And yet, you know, it's more atrocious than it was before, you know? Like what's going on there? You just go, oh, this is bad. 
But, you know, it's been bad for, uh, I won't talk about Ukraine because I don't know anything. Um, well, actually, I was about to say, I mean, I, I was only, I, I, I was like, I took a few days, relaxed, and then I didn't read the newspaper. And mm-hmm. I came back and I was reading yesterday. I was like, oh. It's, it's you know, this, this idea of unplugging on vacation is actually a very powerful tool. Like you, you can truly uh, wake up and go, God what have I been doing? Like, I'm just poisoned. I'm poisoned by the sociosphere around me and this garbage device that I'm hooked to and addicted to and all of that. And it's it's possible to unplug. I just released a video with uh, my friend uh, Angelo about- I saw that Angelo. Yeah, about yeah, our meditation. meditation retreat. And th- there really is something like you come back and there's an aura that lasts for probably about a week where you're like, I, I could never plug back in again and it would be just fine. Unfortunately- you know, your videos are a little bit a little bit less frequent. You know, I really liked your video on daylight savings. I learned something. Oh, so, thank know. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know what it is, is um, it's actually reasonable to talk about as we wrap up. Yeah. The I really am feeling like I cannot make a video unless I really care about deeply what I'm talking about. And there's a lot of pressure to make videos. You know how it is, right? You have a YouTube channel that's very successful. If you stop, the algorithm starts to fucking hate you. Like I didn't put out a video for a couple of weeks or something on YouTube. And then I put up my meditation video and it's like, the algorithm's Crickets. like, what is this? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and that's, I have to accept that that's okay and not worry about it because I'm at a place now in whatever this arc of the thing that I'm doing where I just can't do anything that feels not authentic. It, it just starts to burn. It's like, it feels like kryptonite. Whereas before, you know, it's like, okay, I can do, I, I know this video is gonna do well and it's important. I'm just gonna do it even though I'm not really feeling it. And uh, I can't do it anymore. So it may be that my days are numbered as ZDog MD. who knows? Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, I may ask you for I a mean, job. I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess, I guess like, um, I mean, I look forward to your videos because sometimes, like, I don't want to do all that homework. And I just want <laughs> that's you to why do it I watch your me. videos, dude. <laughs> uh, I know. That's how I was like, because the daylight savings, you got into some stuff. You obviously had read about it a lot more than I had read about it. And I cared I, about it. I yeah. actually, I listened to the, you know, your podcast version of it uh, when I was riding my bike. Um, but very interesting. Um, and uh, I mean, all I know is. I mean, I'm not an expert on daylight savings and all the biological consequences. I actually think that, I mean, you did a great job of sort of getting into it, but I think there's like all these second or third order things that could happen. Right. I don't even know. Like, right. like, for instance, like a lot, of, I don't know. I mean, if I was running a company, what I'd say is if it like really was dark as shit for, uh, you know, half the year in the morning, then I'd say, you know, we're just going to start an hour later. That's so right. I, you know, I'll stick it right back to them. You change the clock, I'll change my start That's time. That's right. Fuck you, you know. That's I'll, right. Like, I'll get you back, you know. But anyway, but I was, um, but I was learning about. It. But I, I do have to say that if if you're if the energy policy of a nation, like the way we're gonna fight climate change and tackle our energy, is just to keep changing our clocks, I think we got some work to do. <laughs> we got some work to do. Like you need to be figuring out how to get some better energy. Come on, just change the clock. Yeah. Like, just just set it, change the clock. You know, we, we, and people underestimate what this means. Like it's a massive socioeconomic, ecological, psychological thing when you t- tamper with the social calendar. So forget about time. Time is, look, we go around the sun the way we go around the sun. Like that's not changed. It's the social clock. Like you said, oh, I'm just gonna move my start time later. Th- that's what we're doing when we move the clock is we're saying we're we're socially agreeing to move start times into the dark or into the, into the light more and, and borrow an hour from here and put it here. And um, that has massive second order and third order and fourth order effects, uh, as you say. So uh, again, you can't just make these decisions lightly. And, and when Congress did it in 73, they 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 realized they'd done fucked up AA, Ron, and they, <laughs> they came back the next year and they're like, this sucks. We're going back. They made daylight time, savings time permanent then. And then they, they, they undid it. So we'll see what ends up happening, but it's worth talking about. Um, so those kind of things get me all fired up. Um, but like, you know, I don't know if I've talked about COVID, uh, on my show, like I love talking about it with you because it's just, it, it's, it's a dialogue, but if I have to do more rants about it, I swear I'm going to stab my eyes out. I just, I'm just not, you know, it's not like, you see, this is like part of your, your general wheelhouse. Like you study this stuff, like, yeah, but even then you're going to get tired of it. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I get tired about is like, everyone's like, oh, oh, CDC has got a new mask study. I'm like, oh, and then everyone's like, oh, you want to read it? And I'm like. And then I, I look at the top line results. Like, uh, according to the CDC, mask stop ninety nine percent of COVID. I was like, oh Jesus Christ, ninety nine? You say? Yeah. You say nine? You gone up to ninety nine? Okay, let me see. <laughs> I, I suspect there's something wrong with 
this paper. But then I have to like to find the things that are wrong with it. It's going to take like 15, 20 minutes of reading. Right. And do I want to uh, do I want to spend that every single day reading? And then they had another one. Myocarditis yeah, is way more that. common after infection. And then I looked at it. The first thing they were like, we looked at anyone who was in our EHR system with a documented SARS-CoV-2 infection. Oh, my and God. And their rate of myocarditis was, and I was like, no, no, their rate of a billing code for myocarditis was. And I was like, well, first of all, most of the people with the infection are not in your fucking system. Yep. So what are you even talking about? Your denominator about? is totally uh, fucked up again. It's the same totally. thing they always do. And it made the <laughs> news. It made the news. Okay, uh, final verdict. Final verdict. CDC says X. It's it's complete horror. So that kind of shit pisses me off. It really does. Yeah. I'm like, it's like propaganda. Yeah. And I'm like, are the people, I'm like, are the people doing this work that stupid that they don't say? Yeah. I mean, like, is it deliberate or not? I don't even know. Like, is it deliberate or is it not deliberate? And if it's not deliberate, who has allowed these people to be researchers? Yeah. <laughs> Because if you don't know yeah. the most basic things, and then I make a, then I then I tweet that it's bad, and someone says, actually, actually, I was like, all right, and here so we go. Still, that here we go. <laughs> then I then then I tweet again, even like more simply. Then I use an analogy. Oh, okay. Then I made a video with a little graphic to kind of to explain, and and then you know I still think they don't get it, and I'm like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's it's you know, and what do you think of Rochelle Walensky as we wrap up, Rochelle Rich, oh, Rich, Rich, Walensky? Uh, doing a yeah. review of the CDC. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, oh yeah, like, she's like, we need a reorg. Yeah. She's like, things aren't going well. We need a reorg. I was like, the only reorg is you need my resignation letter on my desk. That's the reorg <laughs> I want to see. Uh, <laughs> reorg. You see? You see what Redfield said? Uh, the previous CDC director. He was like, yeah. The, the you know what did he say? He's like, I couldn't get to the metal detectors at the airport because of all the shrapnel in my back from when I was CDC. So apparently he was pissed Whoa. that everybody else was taking a shit on him. All the previous CDC directors yeah. when. Uh, I mean, that you know, is, he was, he, yeah, the, you should read that. There's a good Vanity Fair article by, I think, Catherine Iban about, um, lab leak and, uh, it's really good. And there's some uh, good Redfield quotes in it. Oh, great. But, uh, yeah. I don't know. She didn't do a, she didn't do a good job. She's, she's in the Peter Marks bucket of not so good. Right. right. Peter Marks, Jeff Zients, whatever this guy is, the new, the current COVID czar. Um, you know, when you have a lower vaccination rate, among elderly people than Brazil, I think you, know, you kind of <laughs> drop the ball, you know? I was like, kind of, kind of oh man. Hey, by the way, and what happened to vaccines for toddlers? Did that just go away or was the data so abhor abhorrently bad? Cause I, we know that it wasn't working well from a, even a serological standpoint, right? You're talking about the Pfizer. The yeah, Pfizer, they, yeah. They just, they've been mums the word about Pfizer. Yeah. By the way, Normally, when you run a non-inferiority study and like it didn't work, you don't just to be you don't just get to say like, oh, we, we just we just get add the third dose now. <laughs> keep, we keep trying. Then we add a fourth dose, and then we add a fifth dose. We just keep trying. Meanwhile, though, Moderna has a press release that they have a success, um, but you know they're talking about twenty-five micrograms times two, mm. fifty micrograms. That's a that's a that's a mode that's an interesting dose. <laughs> mm. I got some uh, vaccine researcher from the United Kingdom email me is to say like are are you seriously considering if you have like a four year old who had Omicron and recovered you're gonna about to give him fifty micrograms of Moderna. Of, uh, a Moderna, yeah, and then if they were uh, five years old, then they get uh, ten times two, uh, <laughs> they get twenty. So that's an interesting. This thing. is odd. Look, odd. I, I, yeah, odd. I think um, I, I think you know when when Omicron hit, I think I was speculating that. And again, you shouldn't do this, but I was like, you know, this is the beginning of the end of this thing because everyone's going to get infected. We're going to have some mass of immunity and the next variant's going to be less uh, deleterious. And I think so far we're seeing that with BA2. I think it's like a nothing burger, you know, it, it's the predominant strain now in the US, but, you know, at least until the immunity wanes, right, by, by the winter. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, I, I, I'm living my life. That's that's the best we can do. I've I've modulated risk for myself and my family the way I feel is appropriate and moving on. You're not under the thumb. Nobody can mandate you do anything, huh? Well, they can. I just uh, and, and then I'll and then I'll pretend to obey and then secretly won't. <laughs> Actually, you can. You have. Hey, by the way, here's a tipping point in the Bay Area. The grocery stores are now only 25 percent of people wearing masks in an unmandated mask environment. So something is starting to as spring warms up, people are starting to open up. I hope that I can see like somebody working in restaurants not wearing masks. That would be nice, yeah. yeah. That would be nice. We're watching a lot of K dramas, these Korean dramas on uh, Netflix, and uh, even pre COVID, like 
it was just etiquette in in food preparation that they wear this like kind of face shield thing that prevents them from spitting in people's foods and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'd love to see data that says that that actually helps. But uh, it's interesting. It's a very cultural thing. I don't know. The last thing I saw interesting was The Dropout. You watching that on Hulu? No. Is it good? Yeah, it's Elizabeth Holmes. Oh, that one. Yeah. No, I haven't seen it yet. I got to check it out. There's something people have such a fascination with people who pull off these kind of cons for so many years, you know? Yeah. It's a morbid fascination. It really is. You know, so I know a, 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 oh, oh, go, no, oh just real quick. I know I'll a Silicon ahead. Valley billionaire who's kind of royalty in the Silicon Valley in the healthcare space. And they told me they knew Elizabeth Holmes at the time and had this sneaking suspicion that she was schizotypal or had some personality disorder. Like this was before it all came out. And, um, she just, it would say that she was just a very odd creature uh, on many levels, so. <clears throat> There's something interesting there. And I think that like when you watch the show and even when I've read the books and I listen to podcasts and all this stuff, I still don't have my finger on, like she did, not only did she fool people, but she really put the hook in them. Like they really believed yeah. um, that what she was saying is true. And uh, it doesn't even pass like the most prima facie sniff test because it's not possible that you could run all those tests off a single drop of blood, you know? Right. And I think every single person who knew anything about blood testing was like, there's just not enough blood there to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and yet she persisted. It's, it's basically like blood coin, you know? It's like the cryptocurrency blood made coin. of blood, you know? Like a, it's one big Ponzi scheme. <laughs> it is. I'm gonna get all these angry messages from crypto enthusiasts now. What do you mean, blood coin? Crypto's crypto. the future of, of, of currency, Bitcoin. God, I, I don't under, I don't understand. It I don't get it. But yeah, I mean, I I can't invest in something I don't understand. That's the thing. Unless it's like well, hedge money. So I have a little bit of it, but it's it's hedge money. It's like kind of gambling. What money. does hedge money mean? Me, meaning meaning just uh, I know nothing money about. Are willing it. to lose? I'm willing to lose it. Like because people talk about it, it's fine. It's maybe that's the tulip, the Dutch tulip bulb craze of the 21st century. I don't care. Uh, here's a little gambling money, right? Uh, yeah, that's how I see crypto, but I may be an idiot. I am an idiot. I know nothing about it. I'm an idiot because I don't spend any time thinking about money. <laughs> <laughs> I need to focus. Well, no, actually what it. you're doing is you're building so much of your own personal growth that you'll never have to worry about it because you'll just do well at whatever you do. Whereas I plan on, I plan on working until I, you find me at my desk. Oh, just deceased. coded. Yeah. yeah. What are you going to die yeah. of? What do you think? What do you think is going to get you? Mm, probably cardiovascular disease. I'm an Indian man after all. That's true. But you're an oncologist, which means you usually die of your own uh, specialty, right? Uh, you think it's, uh, I, you have that premonition when you choose your specialty? There's something, That's you know, it's a thing that, that the, if House of God said it, like, you know, you just kind of die of your, uh, you die of your specialty. So cardiologists have heart attacks, cancer docs die of cancer. My wife, who's a, a lung uh, radiologist, chest radiologist, she's like, oh, I'm going to get... Um, adenocarcinoma, like non-smokers, uh, lung cancer. Like I just know it or pulmonary fibrosis or something, you know, terrible. Mm, I see. And I'm like, well, I'm not taking care of you if you get one of those fucked up <laughs> long-term lung diseases. So I'm just going to sign a post nup right now. You know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, I think, uh, I play the odds. The odds are, you know, for with our, with our background, you know, we're not used to this rich Western diet, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I follow your I follow your diet. Most days I probably don't eat anything. Right. You know? Yeah, the one meal a day. You know, I went and off. And I exercise a lot. Yeah. yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. I, I try to too. I, I went off the rails when we went uh, to Southern Cal a while back for a week. I was eating three meals a day for the first oh, time. And I gained 10 pounds in a week. 10 oh, pounds. Oh my God. Dude. And I lost it over two weeks. But man, it was brutal. My metabolism is adjusted to this this sort of the one meal kind of snake like python eat a goat and then digest it over the rest of the time i can't even eat if i eat breakfast i feel sick i feel really yeah sick. i feel ill oh i felt ill for the first couple of days until i adapted then i was hungry all the time because my insulin secretion had just gone through the roof bad dude i also believe for exercise that you know that feeling when you're exercising and you feel like you're gonna die yeah I, I, I try to achieve that feeling every time. <laughs> <laughs> Where you hit the wall, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. You feel like you wish for you wish that you were not even doing it, and the pain and misery is so bad. 
Uh, that's maybe that's perfect. That's yeah. great. Now, my buddy Ron Sinha, who's been on my show, he's an internist down here, specializes in South Asians actually in metabolic syndrome. Mm-hmm. He says that kind of exercise is actually bad because it raises your cortisol and makes things oh, worse. Everyone says all these things. <laughs> uh, no, no, <laughs> no, no offense, but you know, I always hear everyone always got some story to yeah. tell me, like, um, oh, you don't want to. Remember what did Trump say? He said any exercise is bad because the body only has finite energy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Bill, Bill Gates used to believe that we had a finite number of heartbeats, and if you speed up your heart rate by exercise, you're just burning through your life. But you know, the truth about all these things is, like, I'm sure that some diets change LDL and triglycerides and cortisol in deleterious ways, and others don't. And I'm sure that some types of exercise raise some of these inflammatory things, and others don't, and these things. But what I have no idea is, is whether or not those proximate changes in metabolites actually predict long-term outcomes. Right. And if you and and when you draw upon studies where they're like, oh, people with I don't know whatever, high cortisol live longer, live shorter than other people with lower cortisol, that's not the same scenario because what you're saying is those people just happen to have like a resting baseline higher rate. Right. Um, but it's not the question of whether or not if I do this exercise and if that's the way in which my cortisol goes up, does that increase or decrease my longevity, I don't think anyone has any cl- yeah, clue. Nobody knows. Nobody knows at all. Nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody knows and stuff. all these are surrogate markers too. And it's kind of just like, what, what, what are we even doing? You know, you have to find the right diet that you're, that's sustainable, that you're happy and you feel good and whatever. I mean, that's, that's it. And your exercise. And goal, my yeah. goal is so I can still fit in the pants I had since college. You know, <laughs> that's my goal. It's yeah. an approximate goal. Yeah. So you have a very specific goal, right? Yeah. I don't want to buy new clothes. I'm cheap. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell I have yeah. Some ja- I have some jackets I really like. I want to be able to wear them. Dude, you got to wear one of them on my show. Remember that? The leather one. I that that long. Oh. But you remember that jacket. But then you turned up the temperature. You, I know, you and you had to take it jacket. off, man. You smoked me out of it. And, and, then, and, then, and then Marty went all old school old man on us and got us all sweaty too. Uh, you and, know. Then, and then he had some soup. <laughs> 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 Marty McCary is a is a is a is a American treasure. I'm just gonna say that. But you go out really to eat do. with him. I really like. Oh, yeah, man, he's such a funny guy. Yeah. I really like him. And I was talking to somebody, and they're like, "Why do you like Marty so much?" And I was like, "You just have to have a meal with. Just him. have a meal he's with him. Really, just have a meal. With very, him. very funny, fun loving person. He really is. He just and he doesn't give an f. Like he's just That's he'll. I yeah, him. I love it. You know, like this this waitress. The interaction between him and the waitress was just <laughs> priceless. So this, you know, this juice how come you haven't learned from. <laughs> him how come you know <laughs> he won't like us telling him about this. yeah yeah uh, hey how you know how come you haven't I, so i've actually learned something from him which i feel like that i wonder if, how come you haven't taken the lesson which is that you know if you crap on marty it's like be it's like water on a raincoat it just beads right up and like and then he told me like you know he's like how like you know just never never even think twice about it uh, um Huh? I need to learn. I, I feel like I have digested that more than you've digested. Yeah, you have, you have, you have. You know what it is? I, I, I think it's just that I find that there's an element of truth and criticism of me sometimes because sometimes it is me just being a, a little bitch or being inauthentic and people are, are piling on and I'm like, you know what? I never even should have said that because I don't really care about that. So why am I even talking about that? So now I just try to stick to stuff that I care about. Now, if people criticize me about stuff I care about, then I'm interested in why, because I want to, I want to learn. But then if, if I disagree, then I'm like, well, it is water off a duck's back. And then, you know, there's the whole, you know, process of meditation and awakening that is a separate thing that at some point you get this realization that none of it matters. Like it's just all happening perfectly orchestrated and there's there's nothing that you can do to change it. And then it's just equanimity. But that's, you know, that's an asymptote. <laughs> Let's close on that. Yeah. That's well put. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, it's always a joy, man. I, I just love these conversations. Um, you guys know what to do. Subscribe to the show. You can check out Vinay's uh, stuff. I'll put the links in the show notes. And um, if you guys do, if you do subscribe on a podcast channel, please do and leave a review. It helps us actually grow our reach a lot. You know, it, uh, it, it's, it's important. And then um, if you want to join either of our groups, you know, Vinay's on Substack. We're all over the place. Substack, that's the place. And for you, it's locals. Locals, yeah. Or anywhere, you know, zdogmd.com forward slash supporters, you can join our supporter group and you actually I'm get CME. I'm supposed to be on locals and they're probably mad at me, but I haven't had time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. A, if you local. need any help with that, let me know. Local's a great place because um, they, they can't they can't cancel you and uh, it's just a nice, you get a, you get a group of people who care about what you care about, which is great. 
It's great. I got to work on it. I mean, I am, I'm behind on some things. Once I catch up, once I catch up, I keep telling myself, yeah, but once I catch up. You're kind of a, I don't know, vaguely busy guy, clinically full-time professor, writer, Tired. guy. Yeah, it's a Tired. lot. It's a lot. Sometimes I look at you and I can't believe the stuff you do, but because at your age, when I was whatever, 38, 39, whatever you are, I, I was just, I actually, I had that kind of energy. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so the future so i know the future now i yeah, know the future yeah. the future is fat lazy gain 10 pounds on vacation by eating a normal three meals a day that's your future <laughs> and on that positive note yes we, out. we are out <laughs>